Good morning and welcome again to Greenfield in the Diaspora on this first Sunday of June. A couple of special things this morning. First of all, we are celebrating together our first ever virtual communion. And I hope that you have received a copy of the How to Prepare for a Home video. If you haven't though, there is plenty of time for you to go and get a little piece of bread and some juice so that you can partake in that part of the service. At Greenfield, all are welcome at the table. Young and old, black and white, gay and straight, he, she, they, you are welcome. Today we are also celebrating our six wonderful high school graduates. Uh, Will and Zoe and Kelsey and Kira and Sarah and Evan, we are so very proud of you. And so we begin our worship this morning with a video that is intended uh, to celebrate them. And then at the end, after the benediction, I'll invite you to stay tuned for a prayer for the graduates, uh, which is intended for them and for their families. Welcome to worship. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavily burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Let's worship God. Enjoy. 
morning. The scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. This, Jesus is giving a parable, and it's about the gifts and responsibilities given to us. How do we use them for God? Hear the words spoken by Jesus. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, 
the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed it over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his, but his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be, will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God. Thanks be to the Lord. Thanks, Doug. In the name of the Father and the Son and God's Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. If a, a person were to rank the parables of Jesus just in terms of how well known they are, I suppose this story would be uh, right up there towards the top. Uh, probably the the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son would, would top the list, but this one would be right up there. Few stories have lived their way more fully into our thinking than this one. In fact, you may not be aware of it, but our contemporary term talent actually uh, derives its meaning from this story. So we speak of a person having a musical talent or uh, a talent for writing or uh, for athletics. Here is where that term originates. So there really is nothing that Jesus ever said that is more familiar to us. It's part of our Western thinking. And that very fact makes it difficult when we are dealing with this passage. Because as soon as you hear Doug reading it, you immediately think, oh, I have heard that before, been there, done that, and that's usually an invitation to tune out. I can see some of you snoozing in your comfy chair at home right now. And for that reason, I want to do something. I want to take an approach that um, we don't normally take when dealing with this story. I have probably preached on this text uh, a dozen times. I have heard uh, many more dozen sermons about it. But very rarely do we focus our attention on the servant in the middle, the one who received the two talents. As you heard in the story, there are actually four characters uh, in the drama. I have heard many a sermon about the rich landowner as a kind of symbol of the God who created the world. Uh, someone who took what he had and then out of sheer generosity gave it to others and then gave us the space and the freedom to do with it what we would. In other words, 
God doesn't micromanage the universe. Guinness McGregor once wrote a little book he entitled, He Who Lets Us Be. And his whole thesis is that God shares his love for us, not only in what God does for us, but in what God doesn't do. When we think of a parent-child relationship, we tend to think of, say, a mother hovering over her little baby. And of course, at that moment in time, that is perfectly appropriate. But if this mother is wise, there will come a time when she will set that child down. She will back away and give that child room enough. Because the truth is we would never learn to walk if we were always carried. Likewise, we would never become responsible if God did not back away and give us room to develop. Ruth Carter Stapleton puts it this way. She says, God will do everything that we cannot do in order for us to live. But God will do nothing that we can do in order for us to grow. Simone Weil says, Creation was the moment that God ceased to be everything so that we humans could become something. So the reason that God doesn't micromanage the universe is so that you and I can grow. I have heard many people say that this would be a better world if only God would intrude a little bit more. And maybe there is some truth in that. There would probably be less tragedy but there would also be less responsibility and less growth. You see, God seems to understand that it is best for us to grow up under God's parental eye, but not God's coercive thumb. So this parable gives us a wonderful insight, I think, into how God works and how God doesn't work. On the other hand, I have heard many a sermon preached on that servant who received five talents. So here is a person who has looked very carefully at the way his master has done his life. He realizes that he works for someone who is very creative, who is a real entrepreneur. And so when he gets his chance, he does exactly what his mentor has done. He is energetic. He is enthusiastic. He's willing to take risks. He understands that this is a participatory universe. God wants to do things for us, but also wants to do things with us. So St. Augustine was right. Without God, we humans cannot. But without us... God will not. Life, therefore, is meant to be a joint venture. It's a partnership. We are not just passive victims. And that is true even in our day of high cybernetics. I, I saw this cartoon in the New Yorker not long ago. There is this word processor that is working feverishly. And the man goes to the door and calls out, Come quick, Edna! Come quick, my book is writing itself on the word processor. Well, computers can do a lot of things, and over the last couple of months, some of us have learned a lot more about that, but there are some things that it cannot do because God meant for us to be participants. God wants our fingerprints on the evidence of life. And so this man who started out with five talents makes five more and is a symbol of the, the creativity and the partnership that every one of us is called to. But I suppose, just in terms of the sheer number of sermons, I have probably heard more about the goat in this story than the hero. I'm talking about the one who is given just one talent and who, perhaps for a variety of reasons, chose to chooses to do nothing at all with it. He just buries it in the ground. And so when the time comes, he has nothing to show for all that he has been given. Now, there's been all kinds of speculation as to why he failed so terribly. Some would say that he was just lazy. 
Inertia, some people say, is the essence of original sin. Just not having the energy to get off the couch in the middle of the afternoon. That sense of apathy that is not really too far from any of our hearts. Others have suggested that this is just a blame-oriented person, and you have probably already realized that when he is called to give an account for himself, he immediately begins to point an accusing finger at his master. He says, it's because you are who you are that I am who I am. And there are many people who never get beyond that blame game. I heard the story not long ago about a scuffle that broke out in an elementary school playground. The teacher came by and uh, quieted things down. She turned to them and said, all right, who started this? And one little boy said, well, it all started when he hit me back. Sad to say that we are becoming increasingly a blame-oriented culture, always looking for a scapegoat rather than looking at ourselves. And it all starts at the top, really. It could be that that is this man's problem as well. Or maybe the deepest answer is that he just let fear get the better of him. You know, the reality is if you live in apprehension, if you are always worrying What if this happens? Or what about that? It does tend to immobilize you, to undo the most creative and enthusiastic parts of you. So for whatever reason, this man completely fails in his mission. And I have heard sermons about how the thing that God most despises is not our failure, but our unwillingness to to try. In fact, there is actually an apocryphal version of this story that appears in one of the Gospels that didn't make its way into the Bible. Um, The stories uh, go pretty much parallel until you get to this third uh, servant. Um, And in this case, that servant takes his one talent and he tries his very best. But just through bad luck and ineptitude, he fails and he loses it. When the master comes back in this version of the story, the master says to that one talent failure, I know things didn't work out as you planned, but I still love you because you tried. That God is more interested in our efforts than our achievements. I have heard that story, uh, that theme many a time. It is not failure, but our low aim that is the crime. But in all my years of preaching and listening to sermons, frankly, I can't remember too many being addressed to that two-talent servant in the middle. He reminds me of the middle child in a big family, you know, the one who is not firstborn, so probably not the namesake who bears the family's fortune. On the other hand, not the baby of the family who often receives a great deal more attention. Any family therapist will tell you that if you're born in the middle, you have a very special challenge. And the great temptation of those born in the middle, not the first, not the last, is to become so distracted by the context of inequality. So these folks are particularly susceptible to one of the most subtle and yet perennial of all temptations. I call it the temptation of the sidelong glance. Taking our focus off of what we have been given and what we can do, and instead constantly comparing ourselves to other people. And as soon as we take our eyes off of our own gifts, that does have a way of distracting and distorting. It can literally be our undoing. There is a a wonderful old rabbinic parable. It begins with an angel coming to a poor Jewish farmer, just eking out a living on the land that he and his family have been working for generations. And one night this angel appears at the foot of his bed and says to him, 
you have found favor with God. And I have been sent with instructions that you can make any three requests and God will be pleased to grant them. There is only one condition. Your neighbor will be given a double portion of whatever is bequeathed to you. Well, the farmer was so excited, he woke his wife up immediately to tell her what had happened. And she, being infinitely practical, says, well, there's only way to, one way to find out, and that's to put it to the test. Let's ask God for something. And it won't surprise you that given their poverty, their first request was a materialistic one. The farmer got down on his knees and said, Yahweh, Lord God, King of the universe, please give me a thousand cattle. If I could have that kind of herd, it would help me to break all of the cycle of poverty. And no sooner had he uttered those words than he heard mooing outside of his front door. He went and there in the early dawn light, he saw a thousand magnificent animals, just what he had prayed for. He spent the next two days back and forth between praising God for all of God's goodness and also beginning to make provisions for his recent affluence. And the second afternoon, he was up on the hillside behind his home trying to figure out where to build a new barn when for the first time he looked across at his neighbor's field. And standing there were 2,000 magnificent cattle. And for the first time since that angel had appeared at his bedside, the joy that had filled his heart evaporated, taken up into a spirit of jealousy and envy that took its place. He came back to his house that evening in a foul mood, didn't speak to his wife, just pushed the food around on his plate. He went to bed early that night, but every time he closed his eyes, all he could see was his neighbor's good fortune. But then deep in the night, he remembered that he had been granted three wishes by the divine. And so he refocused on his own situation, and the joy began to return. He began to ask, what else do I want? And soon that became clear. He had always wanted a family, a link to the future, someone who would carry on the family name. So he got down on his knees and asked, Yahweh, Lord God, King of the universe, bless my family with a child so that we can have a future. And because of the previous experience, it did not surprise him when some weeks later, his wife came to him and said that she was bearing in her body a life that was not her own. The next months passed in gladness and delight. And sure enough, one Friday night, just as the Sabbath was beginning, his wife gave birth to a wonderful child. The next morning he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. They came to the prayers of the people, and he stood up and said, God has indeed been gracious. Last night a child was born into our house. God is good. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And with that, a flutter of delight went through the entire congregation. Pretty soon his neighbor stood up on the other side of the room and said, God is indeed gracious because last night my wife gave birth to twins. We are so blessed. And when that first farmer heard those words, once again, the joy evaporated. Once again, driven out by a spirit of envy that filled his heart. He went home from worship in a much different mood than he had come. Only this time, the dark spirit would not let up. So later that day, he got down on his knees and made his Third and final request. Lord God, King of the universe, gouge out my right eye. The minute he said it, the angel who had started the whole thing appeared by his side once again and said to him, Why? 
Why, O son of Abraham, have you turned to such dark desiring? The man said, I simply cannot stand to see my neighbor look on his good fortune. I will gladly sacrifice half of my vision for the satisfaction of knowing that he will not be able to look at all on his good fortune. There was a long silence and tears began to form in the angel's eyes. Finally, the angel said, why have you twisted what God meant for blessing? He said, let it be known that your third request will not be granted. Not because God lacks integrity, but because God is filled with mercy. But know this, son of Abraham, the way you have chosen to handle your blessings has not only brought misery to you, but sorrow to the very heart of God. The truth is we never see the goodness of God through the eyes of envy. The sidelong glance deflects us from realizing the gifts that we have been given, every one of us. God means for us to focus on the incredible all rightness of what we have been given and then to do our very best with those gifts. And so what I so admire about this ordinary heroine in the middle of our story is that she didn't let the fact that she had less than one or more than another deflect her into envy or pride. And so you notice she too is acclaimed as faithful every bit as much as the one who is given more. Truth be told, um, most of us are most akin to this second servant. Not a whole lot of geniuses among us and no no no-brainers. Very few terribly rich, none absolutely poor. There are folks who have more than us and many more who have less. And the great challenge is to realize the gift that we have been given and then to partner with God with everything that is in us. Bob Benson was sort of a 20th century counterpart of this man in the gospel. I heard him say years ago, I heard him tell about a story um, involving his sixth grade boy in an end of the year play at school. He said his son had had high aspirations that winter um, that he would be given a big part in the production. But when they went through the tryouts and the roles were assigned, he actually wound up with a very minor part, just a couple of lines right there at the end of the production. There was no air conditioning in the building that night. Bob said he sweated through the entire performance. It came almost to the end and the time for little Mike to give his two very small lines. This is what Bob wrote when he got home. I was so proud of Mike tonight because when it came time for him, he was ready. He said his lines and he said them well. Not too soon, not too late, not too soft, not too loud. He said his lines and he said them well. And Bob went on. I too, he said, am a bit player in the whole drama of history. My name will never go down in any history book. I only have a line or two in the whole drama. But, he said, when the curtain comes down and the stage is vacant, my hope above all hopes is that I will hear the voice of the author call my name and say, you said your lines well. Not too soon, not too late, not too loud, not too soft. You said your lines, and you said them well. It's not how much we have been given. It's what we do with what we have. Every one of us, ordinary as we may be, can be heroic.
Amen. This is the table not of this church or any church. This is the table of the Lord, and you are welcome. Come, not because you're strong, but because you're weak. And not because any goodness of your own gives you a right, but because you desire mercy. Come, because you love the Lord a little, and you would like to love him more. But above all, come, because he loves you because he gave his life for you. The Apostle Paul has written that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. When he had offered thanks, he broke it and gave it to his friends. Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup this cup, he said, is the new covenant poured out in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. We have come sitting together east, west, north, and south, in God's kingdom. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us pray. God of comfort and challenge, God of peace and justice, we come this morning so glad to be back at your table again. It has been too long. Although we know that you are with us always, we have missed being with you, being with each other in this special way. We come in the midst of a time of turbulence and trial, separated from each other when we most need to be with one another loved ones who can't be with family when they are sick, families that can't grieve 
together, the loss of loved ones, graduations, wedding plans altered. Our families are stressed, not only from being apart, but sometimes from being together so much in these new and challenging roles, cut off from all of the activities and supports that help to shape our daily lives. People are furloughed, businesses closed, each trying to figure, figure out how to open next. Money and sometimes even daily food has become harder to come by. In the, midst, in the midst of all this, the virus that has plagued us since our birth as a nation has resurfaced. If we're honest, it never really went away, but it has spiked yet again. So today we give thanks for peaceful protesters, so many young people, black and white, who are demanding change. We pray for good police officers who stand by and who kneel beside those who they are trying to protect, trying to keep people and property safe. May this be a time of soul searching for every one of us and for us as a nation. Loving God, on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus crested that Mount of Olives. He looked out over the city and began to weep. Jerusalem, would that even today you knew the things that make for peace, but today they are hid from your eyes. And surely today you weep over every one of our cities and each one of us. Thank you for this bread and cup that remind us, everyone, that we cannot do this all by ourselves, but that with you all things are possible. Comfort us in our brokenness. Challenge us to become all you have created us to be. Hear us now as in a few moments of silence, we lift before you our own joys and concerns. And now, loving God, gather all of these together into the one prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to partake in the bread and the cup as you are watching those on our communion video doing so. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
body of Christ broken for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Doug, the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. In gratitude, deep gratitude, for this moment, for this meal, for these people that we share it with, we give ourselves to you. Lead us into the future, O oh God, to live as a changed people, because we have shared the living bread with you and with each other and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much from us, enable much by us, encourage many through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go out into the world in peace. Live as free men and women. Serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit among you. As you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, may the communion of God's Holy Spirit rest upon you, today and forevermore. Amen. Our prayer for the graduates. <laughs>